So first section, there were two things we talked about mainly. We looked at scatter plots. We said a scatter plot displays the relationship between two numeric variables. And if you had to describe that relationship, what were the four things you talked about? Form. Form. Unusual direction strength, right? FUDs. Other thing we talked about was correlation. Where that's leading us today is to finding what we call the least squares regression line. It's just the line of best fit. Okay, so least squares regression line, whenever you see that, that's just the line of best fit. Okay, you've seen lines before, right? When you did this in algebra, you did y equals mx plus b. It's a similar idea. So we're still going to have a slope and a y-intercept. The general form is y hat. We'll talk about what that means in a minute. I told you that generally we like to put the y-intercept first plus bx. So this is our general equation. Y is the actual value for a given X. Y hat is the predicted value for a given X. So we said ultimately where we're going is we're taking some data like you see here, some points. We're fitting a line to it so that we can use that line to predict different values of y. So let's take a look at the example here. Carrie and Danielle wanted to investigate if tapping on a can of soda would reduce the amount of soda expelled after the can has been shaken. For their experiment, they vigorously shook 40 cans of soda and randomly assigned each can to be tapped for 0 seconds, 4 seconds, 8 seconds, or 12 seconds. Then, after opening the can and cleaning up the mess, the students measured the amount of soda left in each can. Here is a scatter plot with the least squares regression line. Okay, so this is what we're going to be coming up with today. Again, least squares regression just means line of best fit. So the first thing that we're going to do is predict the amount remaining for a can that has been tapped for 10 seconds. So 10 is going to go in for our tapping time. So the predicted amount of soda will be 248.6, add 2.63, multiplied by 10. I'm just going to tell you what the answer is because you know how to use a calculator. And you get 274.9 milliliters. That is a prediction. So if I shook a can of soda for 40 seconds, and then I tapped for 10 seconds and opened it, I predict that 274.9 milliliters would be left in the can. Do you think if I actually did this, it would be exactly 274.9? No, probably not. So it's very important to me that you recognize that that is a prediction only. Okay, questions before we keep going? Okay. That's stuff we're skipping. At the top, predict the amount remaining for a can that has been tapped for 60 seconds. Can I trust that you can plug 60 into that equation? Okay. I'm going to tell you it's about 406.4 milliliters. Now, here's the big question. How confident are you in that 60 seconds? Keeping in mind what we just talked about with the warm up a little bit ago. It's like way higher than the variables that were used before. Okay. Do you notice that 60 is way higher than the tapping that was done before, which was 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, I think was the highest one? 60, way higher than that. So how, how confident are we? Uh, not very. And I'm going to say not very because, like Evan said, 60 seconds is so much higher than the 0 to 10 used in the experiment. 
Now, if I instead asked you to use your model to predict the amount of soda remaining for 12 seconds, that's pretty close. 12 seconds, still not the greatest model to use, but it's okay. 60 though, way too far out. And it leads to what I said when we did the warm up extrapolation. So extrapolation is using the model to predict the y hat for an x value outside those used to create the line. So in our soda example, it was anywhere from zero to 10 seconds. So we really should not use the model for anything outside of zero to 10 seconds. We can use it to predict if we tap on seven seconds, but not 15. Okay, so obviously I think you know, is it a good idea to extrapolate? No, of course not. Now, I always want to know, though, why is extrapolation bad? So if I were to ask you, predict the amount of soda remaining for a can that has been tapped 70 seconds, are you going to do that? You're going to say, no, that's extrapolation. I want to know why extrapolation is bad or what the issue is. So with extrapolation, this is an issue because we do not know if this model is appropriate for values outside zero to 10 seconds. That's the issue. We don't know if that is actually the most appropriate model. Questions on extrapolation. Okay, next thing that we are gonna do is we are gonna talk about slope and y-intercept. So to remind you, our equation from the previous page is 248.6, add 2.63x. Okay, we're gonna talk about y-intercept first. Thinking back to y-intercept from algebra, that's when your x is zero, so it's zero comma b or zero comma y, which is that 248.6. Now I'm gonna talk, then we're gonna write. The y-intercept is the y-value when x is zero. That's almost the same in stats. The only exception or the only little difference is our line is a model of the data, it's not perfect. So we are using our line to make predictions. So this is not an actual y value in the data set, it is a prediction. So, the way I'm going to write that, we predict 248.6 milliliters of soda remaining for a can <laughs> tapped for zero seconds. So some things you're gonna notice, of course there's context, right? Milliliters of soda, that's the Y value. Hand that was tapped for seconds, that's the X value. What is most important is that word predict. You have to have the word predict. It is a prediction for the data, it is not true for every single point in the data set. That's not even a point in the data set. Okay, if we take a look at slope, that's at 2.63. If you remember back from algebra, 2.63 is the change in y over the change in x. Change in x. Again, this is a prediction. So this is really 2.63 over one. So if I'm gonna interpret slope, I'm gonna say when, not when, for every additional
second tapped, we predict the amount of soda remaining will increase by 2.63 milliliters. Sorry, I ran out of room. Hopefully you did better with your space than I did. How do we know that the amount of soda remaining is gonna increase and not decrease? Slope is positive, right? As one goes up, the other one's gonna go off. So again, you need to have context, you have to have the word predict, and the additional is really important. A lot of people will say something like, for every second tapped, the amount of soda increases by 2.63. That is not the same, that is not what the slope means. For every second tapped, the amount of soda remaining is 2.63. What is the difference? What would that mean if my statement is for every second tapped, the amount of soda remaining is 2.63? What is that communicating? Talk to the person next to you for 30 seconds and see if you can come up with what does that mean? Because okay. Questions on that before we keep going? The candy grab data I did not keep, so we're not going to do that. This is what I want you to do is go down to the bottom. Talk about a residual. A residual is a numeric measure of the size and direction of the error. And we'll take a look at an example in a minute. The way you find a residual, if you remember AP, you take the actual value and you subtract the prediction. So symbolically, the actual is y. The prediction is y hat. So you take that and it will give you a residual. If you think of your least squares regression line, something like this, or your data, and then you have your least squares regression line, what you are looking at is you are looking at this vertical deviation, this vertical error. That is what a residual is. So it's the vertical difference between what the line would predict and what actually happened. It should remind you of a z-score. Right, so in a z-score, we take the value, we subtract the mean, and we divide by the standard deviation. Well, the mean in our case really is a prediction. Those are pretty similar, and this is what actually happened. So it should remind you of a z-score. So then the next thing that we're going to do is we are going to actually find a residual. Okay, so here's the next page. Calculate and interpret the residual for the can that was tapped for four seconds and had 265 milliliters of soda remaining. So first thing to remind us, a residual is Y minus Y hat. Y is the actual value. So this 265 and this four, four seconds is X. 265 is the actual amount of soda remaining. 
So our residual is going to be 265 subtract y hat. Y hat we don't have, though. So y hat we're going to need to find. Y hat comes from the model. So y hat is what we would predict if we tapped the can for four seconds. So to find that y hat, we're going to have to go back to the equation. So it's going to be that 248.6, add 2.63, multiplied by 4. And if you trust me, that ends up being 259.12. So if you tap a can for four seconds, we predict it's going to have 259 milliliters of soda, but this particular can actually had 265. So to find our residual, we're going to take that 265 and subtract the 259.12. So our residual then is 5.88 milliliters. Okay, so that is the calculating part. We still have to interpret it. This residual corresponds specifically to a can that was tapped for four seconds. So we're going to have to use that in our interpretation. So I'm going to say the can that was tapped four seconds And then I'm going to pause. So this is the actual value. This is the prediction. So all you got to know or notice is the actual value was higher. So the can that was tapped four seconds had 5.88 more milliliters of soda. than what the model predicted. Now it's important that you mention that four seconds because this was a prediction for a can tapped for four seconds. So then the other thing to notice if you have a negative residual So if your y subtract y hat is negative, that means your y hat is bigger than y. So that would mean that your prediction is too big. So that would mean your prediction is too large. Okay, we're going to talk about two or three more things and then we'll take a break. Questions, comments? Okay, so you might be wondering, or maybe you don't really care, why it's called a least squares regression line. Like, where does that name even come from? Okay, so where that name comes from, if we find all the residuals, all the residuals for all the points, this should not shock you. When you sum them up, you're going to get zero. So when you find all the residuals and you sum them up, you're going to get zero. So what we do instead is we find all of those residuals and we square them and we add them up. And we want that value to be as small as possible. And by we, I, of course, mean the calculator. So that's what the calculator is doing, is it's fitting this line. So then when it has all of these residuals and you square them up, 
square them and then add them up, that that number will be the smallest one. You don't need to know that, but that's where it is, or that's what it refers to. Okay, last thing we are gonna do before a break and before we then keep going is we are gonna talk about how to find this on the calculator. Do you guys remember how to find R on the calculator? Okay, so let's go to back to that then. This data, please put this in your calculator, put the femur in list one, put the humerus in list two and calculate R please. Okay, so we get y hat is equal to negative 3.66 add, can you tell me what the slope was? Uh, 1.20x, and then of course you're going to say x is femur, and y hat is predicted humerus. Or the other way that this could be written is sometimes, like you saw earlier, the word will be put in, it, put in the equation. So either one of those would be accepted. I don't like the one on the right because to me it looks messy, but if you prefer to put the words in there, that's fine. That's great. Anybody have issues on the calculator? Okay, so you may or may not remember me telling you this, but you are given some formula sheets for the AP stats exam. This part right here, you don't have it. I just put this up here. It's from the top of the formula sheet and it relates to what we're doing now. So there are some things I wanna show you. This is the first formula. So that is just general regression. You're gonna notice there's a formula for the mean, there's a formula for R, there's a formula for standard deviation. These are not the ones that we want just yet. What we are looking at instead is these two formulas here. So you are not always going to have the raw data to find the regression line. What we're going to take a look at is this computer output below, and we're going to use it to find the least squares regression line. Okay, so our goal is we need to find y hat is equal to a plus bx. What you're going to notice is we have information for x and y. So you'll see over here on the left, we have a line for x and a line for y. We're given information like the sample size, the mean, the standard deviation, so on and so forth. Nowhere though are we given slope or y-intercept. That's when we're going to use these equations above. So the first equation that we're going to use is this equation that has b. So b is equal to r times sy over sx. So looking at this output, correlation is r. So this 0.949 is r. s is standard deviation. So that is right here. So 5 is sy, 1.581 is sx. So substituting those into our equation, r is 0.949, standard deviation of y is 5, standard deviation of x is 1.581. So we get a slope of about 3. Okay, so we have B. What you're gonna notice is there is no equation that is A equals. This equation though, while it is not A equals, it has A. So that equation has A in it. So if we solve for A, then we get Y bar subtract B times X bar. The bars are just mean. So in the output, it's these numbers right here. So that 3 is x bar, the 7 is y bar. So our a then, y bar is 7. b refers to this b that we just found, which is 3. And x bar is also 3. 
So we get an A value of negative 2. So our regression equation then would be negative 2 add 3x. So eventually I will give you the formula sheet, but right now you need to have those two memorized. So right now you will have to memorize those at least before the quiz on Thursday or Friday, whenever you decide to take it. That is the first type of computer output. Questions on that? Okay. A few other things that we're going to talk about. You go to the next page. Up at the top. This is the second type of computer output. This type we really, really like because at the top, it just gives us the regression equation. Now, the vast majority of the time on the AP test, you are going to be given this information only. You will not be given that stuff that's highlighted. But we can still find the equation as long as we know how to read the output. Constant is the y-intercept. So when you say, see, constant is negative 2, that's just the y-intercept above. And then the number next to x is the coefficient on x. So this 3 gets multiplied by x. <clears throat> you need to be able to read both of those kinds of output. Now, something to also show you, fun fact, r squared is here. This r squared adjusted we don't use. So we know that r squared is 90% or 0.9. So I could find r then. I would take the square root of 0.9. Which I put my calculator with, so I don't know what that is. About 0.95. Now here's what we got to remember though. This is always where people go wrong. r can be positive or negative. I just made r positive because that's what I thought of. Should R be positive or negative? Positive. How do we know? Uh, slope is positive. Slope is positive. So R is positive because the slope is positive. Okay, we got like one last thing to talk about. Sound good? Okay, all of this stuff on the rest of the page, we're just skipping. So skip all that. Go to the next page. <coughs> last thing we have to talk about, and this is a really, really big one, is what is called a residual plot. So we already talked about residual earlier. Remember we said a residual measures error? It was our y minus y hat. So a residual plot is a scatter plot that plots every x value versus its residual. Or another way you can do it is it will plot y hat versus the residual. I normally use x, but could be y hat versus the residual. And we'll talk about how to do this on the calculator. The purpose is to assess the fit of the linear model. OK, so. Generally, here's how your process goes if you're a statistician. The first thing that you do is you look at your scatter plot. And if you're like, yeah, this data looks pretty linear, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to calculate R. 
And then if you get a strong R value, so now, okay, I have a graph that my data looks linear. I have an R value that says, yeah, my data is probably linear or is more indicative of being linear. You will calculate your line. And then the last thing that you will do is you will look at a residual plot. <coughs> the residual plot is the final step to assess whether your line is a good fit. If it's not, you got to start all over. By start all over, I don't mean pick a different line. You have to pick a different model. The line isn't the best fit. Okay. Residual plots should remind you of another kind of plot. What other scatter plot did we do that told us information about our data from last unit? Last unit where a lot of what we did related to normal distributions. Okay, love it. Not what I was thinking of, but yes, we also did that graph. Thank you. You guys remember the normal quantal or normal probability plots? Okay, I want to remind us of that. So just as a quick, let's not forget this. A normal quantal, or sometimes called a normal probability plot, a linear plot told us that our data was approximately normal. So now we're looking at a residual plot, which will, like I said, I'll show you how to do on the calculator in a minute. Residual plot, you're not looking for linearity. You are looking for randomness. The points should just be scattered. If they are scattered, that tells you that your line is a good fit to the data. I'm going to show us how to do this in the calculator. We're going to sketch it. We're going to talk about one more thing, and then we will be done. Okay, we got two more things to write down, and then we are done. So our scatter plot looked something like this. Not scatter plot, our residual plot. It asks us to interpret it. All I'm looking for is the residual plot is not random. Therefore, this model is not a good fit for the data. So a curve might be better, but the line is not, um, not a good fit. If you wanted to talk more about it, something that's really noticeable, this is the line y equals zero. So what this is showing us is all of these points have negative residuals and only one has a positive. That's another glaring issue. You should have about half on the top, about half on the bottom. Last thing I need us to write down is two things to look for in a scatter plot. The first one is what we call a fan pattern. And the second one is a curve. So these are you're looking for in a residual plot. Fan pattern is going to be the points are close together and then they start getting much farther out. 
I don't do a good job at this, so hopefully you understand what I'm trying to communicate. The residuals here are close together and they fan out that way. That is something that comes up quite often. That indicates, again, the model's not appropriate. The other thing that you will sometimes see in a residual plot is a curve. Now, that one is like super obvious, but if you see a curve of any kind in a residual plot, that's bad. What that tells you is that the original data is likely curved. The original data is likely curved. Okay, that's what I have for us today. That is not all the notes. We are not done because we are going to do one multiple choice question. Uh, we will finish the notes Wednesday and then do the problem set Wednesday. Sound good?